You may be seated. I want to greet those that are joining us online. Thank you for taking time to do so. We do look forward to seeing you in person. This is the first Sunday of the brand new year. I, 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 I've told you this before. I make it my aim to look everybody in the eyeballs, and I just w- look for that person who gets the most uncomfortable. And just waiting for it, waiting for it, looking for it. But I'm telling you, what I'm reading in the room is I can tell some of those folks who went to bed early and some of y'all who didn't. Good news for you. I went to bed at 9, so I'm ramped. I'm saying... <laughs> Put your seatbelt on. It's, a, it's New Year message time, and I'm pumped. Now, I know there's some number of you that you're like, oh, yeah, it's just another day. We just turned the calendar, yada, yada. You know what? Boo-hoo on you. <laughs> you keep that sourpuss attitude to yourself. I'm not buying. I'm saying, hey, it's a brand new mile marker. We can use this to evaluate. We can look this to, to press into God. We can say, God, what you did then, you can do again. We can look at what may, didn't work out and we can believe God for something brand new to come in the future. This is a great time of year for us to do a, a message around leaving what was before, stepping into a season of learning and then ultimately leading this to be a three-part message, not all in one day. It'll be just on today's leaving. Leaving what was. Now, 2022 was a strange year. For some of us, it was a fantastic year. And for other of us, we can't wait to have closed out the year. I was envisioning in my prayer and prep time today about what, what this new year looks like and, and who might be here and who might not be here. And, and those that would join online and those who would join online later after they slept for a day. But I, I want to I wanna, I wanna talk about three things as I lead into the message and, and thinking through transitioning out of leaving 2022 and stepping into 2023. The first thing that I wanna encourage you with is this. We need to learn to review, not relive. It's okay to review the previous year. It's not okay for us to try to relive it. It's a waste of time. It's not there any longer. We've got to move forward, good or bad. We need to do some review. We need to do some anticipation, but we need to move forward. We need to embrace the new day before us and the new year ahead of us. Jesus said this, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. I personally like that there's this visual of agriculture because what he's saying is is that once you've decided to plow, once you've decided to move forward, you're not doing yourself any favors. You're not doing anything for that new season because like it or not, you're in a new season. If you're constantly looking back like this, we need to be attentive to the assignment that we have. If you go to any of our farmer friends in the community and you try to take them out on a day trip or a vacation during plow and planting season, they're going to laugh you out of the house. No, there's work to be done. Now is not the time to be goofing off. You go follow up with that same farmer, that agricultural person in the harvest season and ask them, hey, you want to take a vacation? They're going to say, beat it. I'm now trying to pull in. I'm reaping what I sowed. That's not the time. But you do have an opportunity before we move forward to do some review before we grab a hold of and commit to letting go, leaving last year and stepping in to something new. The prophet Isaiah says it this way in Isaiah 43. He says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? In other words, the Lord's doing something new. The question is, are you looking for it? Where's your focus? Are we constantly trying to relive what was or what wasn't? Or are we looking ahead with anticipation? Are we seekers? Are we knockers? Are we, are, we, are we looking to find what God has for us right now? Do you perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. In both of the previous services, we paused on that part of this verse. If some of us feel like we're sitting in the center of a wasteland, And I want to encourage you. I want to prophesy this over you. God is the supply that you need. He's going to provide for you in the season. It might feel like hell, but you don't have to stay there. We can move forward. And not only only that we don't have to stay there, it says that God's going to show you the trail, the path to get out of this. You might be in a valley season, but valley seasons don't have to stay forever. The same God who provided then will provide again. So we need to practice review, not relive. Part Uh, number two, not part number two, but second point. We need to assess, not obsess. We need to assess what we learned. We need to assess and do inventory. We need to know where we picked up some fat. And I'm not talking about just unhealthy eating, which 
it was Christmas, okay? I'm talking about access, things that no longer serve us, things that are bogging you down. They were good for a season, but they're not going to help you in this season. We got to calculate what God's downloading in our hearts so that we can do an inventory on what we need to do. What is God asking of us? What is my part? We do need to do an, a, 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 an assessment, but it's easy to sip, slip over into an obsession where now you're, you're frantic, you're worrying, you're, you're, you're spending all of your time thinking about what's, what's next when we don't live in the present. Now, I, I struggle with this. I'm going to be honest with you because I'm a visionary and I'm praying and I'm asking God and I'm looking for the, for, for the future and what's next. And if I'm not careful, I will ignore the fact that I'm living in the provision of God that I prayed for yesterday. And I become this ungrateful kid who just goes, what's next, dad? Now, being present is, is appreciating. Pause, look around, celebrate what God's doing while you're looking where you're going. Luke chapter 14, verse number 28 says, but don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin a construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might only complete or complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everyone will laugh at you. They will say, there's that person who started the building and couldn't afford to finish it. What he's telling us is that we've got to assess and, and, and come into a place of inventory before we just blindly go or without any type of plan. You know, I, I, I get frustrated. I make distinctions. And, and now maybe I'll change it. I'm kind of I'm not really altogether bought into this idea that I don't like dreamers. I do think dreamers are important. But I, I use the distinction between dreamers and visionaries. Dreamers are those people who are always going to do something. They're not all dreamers, but you understand what I'm saying? That in my mind, a dreamer is that, oh, I'm just going to go change the world. Well, can you change by changing your house? I mean, can, you, can, can we start with what we have right in front of us before we, we're going to go do something macro? Let's look at some micro stuff. M meaning that we, we've got to look at what we can do right now with what we have. So we need to review, not relive. We need to assess, not obsess. And thirdly, we need to learn to recalibrate verse, versus rehearse. To recalibrate. Meaning, it's easy to be driven and focused, have a single-mindedness to be going somewhere, and get a little off course. I'd like to encourage everyone, we shouldn't wait till January 1 of next year to do some recalibration. Recalibration is something that we should practice as a routine. But when, when you think in terms of a pilot, if a pilot can be off just a few degrees, well, after a few hundred miles, you're way off course if you don't calibrate. Well, maybe, uh, maybe you were going a certain trajectory. Maybe you, you got off uh, the trajectory that you felt in your heart. Now is the time to recalibrate it. It's, well, let's just read Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 15, verse number 32. This is some pretty harsh correction or rebuke even. Refusing cr constructive criticism shows you have no interest in improving your life. For revelation insight only comes as you accept correction and the wisdom that it brings. Some of us need to humble ourselves to reevaluate, to course correct. Now, I come from the uh, background of engineering and a technical field, working with some precision instruments. And sometimes these precision instruments would get out of calibration. And these instruments were not calibrated by just some average Joe who decided, let me turn some knobs. We usually had to bring in some highly trained, sophisticated individuals that could calibrate these, these pieces of equipment, meaning that we didn't know how to do it or have the tools to do it. So I'd like to encourage you. Part of recalibrating your life is humbling yourself to admit that maybe you don't know what your blind spot is. Maybe you don't have the tools to make the, the incremental change, the adjustment that's needed to, to calibrate again. So perhaps you need to find a mentor, a coach, a pastor, uh, uh, go a seminar, read some books, get, get, get some information, get a hold of some people who know something that you don't. To recalibrate doesn't mean you need to scratch everything either. I, I told this story last service. One of my mentors, Billy Upperhart, tells this story. He got, a, he got into college on a baseball scholarship. It's his first game, his first opportunity to show the coach and to show the university that he was worth the effort, worth the money. He's on the, the, the pitcher's mound. He, he uh, throws so many balls that the whole bases are loaded. Now at this point, before he's about to pitch, 
Coach calls timeout, comes walking up to the mound, and Billy's talking in his head, oh, boy, I blew my shot. He's going to take me out. There goes my scholarship. They're never going to let me play again. Coach walks up and says, uh, hey, Billy, what are you throwing? And I, I actually don't know what the type of terminology that he was, the type of pitch. I'm not a, a baseball player. But he says, well, let me show, you, show me how you're holding the ball. And Billy goes, oh, my gosh, he doesn't even think I know how to hold a baseball anymore. He says, no, no, show me. And so we, he shows him, and the coach reaches down, and he adjusts the ball in his hand just one-eighth of an inch. He says, there you go, and he walks back. Every throw after that was a strike, and he struck out everyone for the rest of the game. Sometimes in your life, it's just a one-eighth incremental change, a recalibration that's needed to get you the results that you need. Now, here's another one. As we come out of this year, I'm sure that some of us had some things that you crushed it. There were some goals. There were some things that I was praying for. There were some things that I was believing for that it happened. There were some goals and plans and ideas and desires that I said I was going to, this was going to be the year. I'm not going to come out of this year doing this again, or I'm finally going to commit to finishing this, whatever that was. And there's a few things in, in 2022 that didn't happen. There's some things that I said, I promised God it was going to be different and it didn't happen and I didn't follow through. And anyone relate? Or am I just going to carry the burden for us all? Okay. Former pastor Mike Foster, uh, now an author and counselor, made this statement. He says, not forgiving yourself is a contract that says if you beat yourself up for the past, then you won't be responsible for anything in your future. It is an agreement to never risk again. Here's the danger. If you have some things in your life that happened or didn't happen, that you didn't follow through or that you made a mistake or you followed up or you stepped into sin or whatever those things are, I need to encourage you not to carry that into the new year. You have to practice forgiving yourself as much as you are taught or trained to forgive others. Yet it is the hardest thing to do to forgive yourself, isn't it? The narrative that we say, the, the areas that we, we start, the, the, start the, the statements that we start saying to ourselves, we start declaring over ourselves, I never, I always, why even try? I, I'm just going to mess up again. Here I go again. I, I said it wasn't going to happen this year, and it, and it did. And so what begins to happen is we now make this new contract, this new agreement, that I'm never going to risk again. And the first service, the 815 service, I was ministering with a person there, and they went through some tough stuff in 2022. In fact, they're still going through some tough stuff. And after they were talking to me and we began to pray, my one encouragement to them, and I want to encourage you all with this, be free to dream in 2023. The, Pastor Steve, I think you said it in the, just, just in worship, that we need to take the lid off. We have to take the, remove the, the obstacles, remove the barriers. And one of the barriers that's going to keep you from experiencing a life of peace and wholeness is if you don't learn to forgive yourself for your own misdeeds and missteps. Amen? That was worth coming to church today for. Yeah, drop the charges on self. Thinking through kind of uh, what today might be like, I, I use my imagination when I pray, and I use my imagination when I, when I prep, and I use my imagination when I study the scriptures because I like to kind of visualize things. And I was thinking, okay, I'm a reader. I like to read. And let's imagine with me, I read through page number one, and I want to read page number two, but how many of you can't read page number two until you turn the page? Maybe you're at the end of a chapter, which we all are. We just ended a chapter. It's called 2022. And you can't begin to experience the new chapter until you turn the page on the, on the old. Now, across this room, there are some people that, like I said, 2022 was a happy year for you. And some of us, 2022 was not so happy. And so I think we shared the same challenge. Here we are. We're at, we're at the end of this chapter and it was so happy for you. You're like, I don't really want to leave this year. I kind of want to stick around in this. So there's a hesitation to turn the chapter. And there's other of us that 2022 was so bad. And it was so pathetic. And we're so upset with it. We're like, what's the use? Why turn the page on just more of this junk? And I realized, and you probably know this, that happiness is based on our happenings. I can't control all that happens to me. You can't control all that happens to you. But I wrote this down, and I want to encourage you. You and I can choose whether to pursue Jesus in 2023 or not. You can choose to pursue what he has for you. Following Jesus 
makes the possible probable. If you commit today that I'm going to follow Jesus in 2023, the possible becomes probable for you and I. I want to go to Luke chapter 5. This is the account where Jesus has stepped out of the wilderness. He had just done the 40 days of fasting. He's about to start his earthly ministry. He's going to pick his first disciples. It's a very different account than the Matthew chapter 4. Luke includes some details that, that Matthew doesn't. And there's so much here. And I, I, I really enjoyed the prep work and preparation for what we're going to talk about, what God wants to communicate. And there's a nugget in here that I'm so excited to share with you that I think that this part of the message, it, you really want to like elbow your neighbor, make sure you're awake for, I know it's hot in here, but stick with me. Uh, I, I actually had to start, I was going to joke and say I had to derobe up here, but that's things that you don't want to hear your pastor say <laughs> on a Sunday morning. Luke chapter five, verse number one. One day, as Jesus was preaching on the shore of the sea of Galilee, great crowds pressed in on him to listen to the word of God. He noticed two empty boats at the water's edge, for the fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push out to, into the water. And so he sat in the boat and taught the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Now go out where it's deeper and let down your nets and catch some fish. Verse number five, Simon Peter responds with, Master, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, one translation says, but at your word, I'll let the nets down again. Now, let's get some background here. Because number one, Jesus is a teacher. He's a rabbi. He's, he, he's a preacher. And he's sitting in the boat of a professional fisherman. And now the preacher's telling the professional fisherman how to catch fish. Now, there's a couple of challenges here. Peter has been doing this all night, which is when you're supposed to fish in the Near East. You don't fish in the hot of the day. You fish at night. Challenge number one. Challenge number two. The preacher tells him, hey, go out into the deep water and drop down your nets. In the Near East, you don't fish in the, in the deep water. You, you fish and throw your nets in the shallows, in the cool of the night, where all the fish have come to, to, uh, to eat. Challenge number three, they're going to go out in, in, at, a, uh, at a time where they've already cleaned all of their nets. Everything is put away. But at your word, he says. Now, what's interesting is if you could put verse number five back up. Luke writes the word master. The word master shows up all over in the New Testament. But Luke is the only one who writes the Greek word that translates here not as teacher, not as rabbi, it's the Greek word that means captain or skipper. And not only does he use it here as captain or skipper, he uses it seven times throughout his book. This is profound to me because what I think was happening here is that Peter, Simon, is announcing that Jesus is the skipper of his boat. You're the captain, Jesus, and from now on, you call the shots. If we could commit our year to saying, Jesus, you're the skipper of my boat. You're the captain. And from now on, you call all the shots. Now let's go back to the boat. What happens? And this time their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. It's awesome. I like to fish. I've never caught that many fish. Verse number seven, a shout for help brought their partners in, uh, in the other boat and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. This is insane. We don't know anything about their partners. All we know is that Peter, at the word of the master, the skipper, the captain, they did what is opposite of what every professional would know to do. And the blessing of God didn't just nearly sink Peter's boat, it sinks their partner's boat, almost. We don't know anything about the partners here. We don't know if they believed God. They, we don't know if they lived holy. We have no idea. There's no indication here. What we do know is that Peter's blessing, his, it came by obedience that not only helped him, but also everybody that Peter was partnered with. I'm praying this over you, your families, your business, our church, 
that your obedience that leads to the blessing of God doesn't just bless you, but because of God's blessing so great on you that it blesses everyone else that you're partnered with. Yeah, it's in the book. If it's in there, I want it. I want to participate. Verse number nine, when Peter, watch this, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees. He confessed to the Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. The blessing of God so gripped his heart that he dropped to his knees in humility and begged the Lord to leave because he knew he wasn't worthy. In his own words, I'm a sinful man. For he was an awestruck by the number of fish that they had caught, as were the others that were with him. This statement might be the most controversial thing that I'll say all weekend. God's blessing isn't contingent on our goodness. It's dependent on our obedience. Here's the disclaimer. Here's the qualifier. Yet God's blessing is designed to impact our goodness. We'll leave it up there. God's blessing isn't contingent on your goodness. Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners and ungodly, God sent his son to die. That's how he demonstrated his love for us. His blessing on you is not based on your goodness. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dependent on your obedience. And Peter was obedient to the word, at your word. I know better. I'm the expert. I know what to do. This is illogical. It doesn't make sense, Jesus. But at your word, I'm going to obey. And that, that obedience brought such blessing on his life that it blessed his boat and it blessed his partner's boat. And you'll notice that the blessing of God didn't make him haughty. It didn't make Peter think that he was the bee's knees. No, he dropped to his knees and he begged the Lord to go, to leave because he knew he didn't deserve it. I'm telling you, when you've been touched by the goodness of God, the blessing of God, it brings you to your knees. It causes you to change. Romans chapter 2, verse number 1. No matter who you are, before you judge the wickedness of others, you had better remember this. You are also without excuse. For you too are guilty of the same kind of things. When you judge others and then do the same things they do, you condemn yourself. We know that God's judgment falls upon those who practice these things. God is always right because he has all the facts. And no matter who you think you are, when you judge others who do these things and then do the same things yourself, you, it, what makes you think that you will escape God's judgment? Do the riches of his extraordinary kindness make you take him for granted and despise him? Haven't you experienced how kind and understanding he has been to you? Don't mistake his tolerance for acceptance. Do you realize that all the wealth of his extravagant kindness is meant to melt your heart and lead you into repentance? Let's play this in reverse. It did not say that your repentance melts the heart of God and gives you access to his blessing. What Paul just said was his extravagant kindness and blessing melts our hearts and leads us to change. If the goodness of God, the provision of God, the blessing of God that's melted away those cruddy things, that hardness, that callous in you, isn't it possible then that through our lives, the goodness of God, the blessing of God that brings us to our knees, that causes us to change, couldn't it be then if we committed as individuals, if we committed as a church, that instead of going out into the community and casting our judgment, how about we cast extravagant kindness? How about we start giving extravagant grace? How about we bless in what we say. We bless in what we do. We bless in what we type. We actually allow the goodness of God to melt down the barriers and he can use us. Now, this might surprise you. I, I've been a part of raising four children. And again, this is just gonna be shocking. My kids, as well as, as I was raising them, didn't always obey. <laughs> I know, I know, I know we tried. They, they, they broke the rules. Sometimes by mistake, sometimes by desire, sometimes by plan. My, my kids broke the rules. And I'll tell you, this, this, is what, this is what happened. They can testify. They're in the service. 
When they were disobedient as youngsters, when they broke the rules and they didn't do what they should, they still got to live in my house. They still got to eat my food. They still got to live in, or drive around in my car that I provided. They slept in a warm bed because I'm the provider for them, not because of what they do. They're my children, right? Now imagine with me, the neighbor comes knocking at my door and they see that my kids have been disobedient, they've been naughty, they've done something wrong or they've sinned and they're gonna come over and try to cast judgment or rule on my children. Might be an opportunity for this guy to get in the flesh, just being real. (laughs) It is not their place nor their responsibility to judge my children's behavior, it's mine. How about we, as the saints of God, let their father judge them and we just live the reflection of God's goodness to our community? Yes! That was such a better response in the first service. You guys should have done better, 915. Oh, I'm sorry. No condemnation for those who are in Christ. Let's go back to the boat. I'm having fun. You having fun? All right. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. And so Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything. They left everything. They left everything behind and they followed Jesus. Don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to fish for people. And when they landed, they left everything. Everything. Someone say everything. Now here's, here's a narrative that I used to play in my head, and I've been hearing it ever since I've been pastoring, ever since I've been in the ministry. People are afraid to give everything to Jesus because they just know full well the moment they give everything to Jesus, he's going to call them to go across the ocean. They're going to be missionaries to tribal people they've never met. They're going to have to live on bugs and insects for the rest of their lives. Can I just encourage you, if God's called you to the mission field to go to the tribal people that don't know your language, know who you are, and they only eat bugs, you're already craving bugs right now. Jesus talked their language. He said to them, you are professional fishermen. What's already been in you, I'm just going to elevate you. I'm going to promote you. Now what you're doing is going to help bring eternal benefit to people. Most of us have something within us, that purpose of God that's innate. You were born with it. And God wants to use what you do and God wants to use what you have, but he wants to use it to another level. I believe in 2023, God wants to promote us. And here's here's what I think. If if you're a parent uh, or an educator, you can can testify to this. If you want to teach a child to count to 100, all you have to do is teach them to count to 10, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10. And then you start over at 1, 11, Right? Some of us are at level one, but we're experts. We're a 10 out of a 10. And we are a big fish in a small pot. We know the stuff. We are are respected. We have the answers. We are the go-to people. And I salute you. That's great. At least you're not one still. But God is asking us to be promoted then. In order to be promoted, you have to humble yourself and be willing to go up, but you've got to start at one. That's hard for us. Because now we have to journey in uncertainty. We have to move in, in, in new spaces, things that we're not as familiar with. We, we got to humble ourselves and, and seek knowledge and understanding and get mentoring again. We, we got to feel uncomfortable. Where the temptation to stay at 10 on level one is so easy because you got this down. But God wants to elevate us into spaces that are more eternal, that are blessing others. And we can't do it if we don't start or willing to start at one. Our example, Hebrews chapter 11, verse number eight. This is Abraham. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as an inheritance. An inheritance is a gift. It's a blessing. He went without knowing where he was going. God is is doing his very best to tell you, to tell me, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. The key is not how I'm going to do it. It's not important that you know the steps of how we're going to do it. The key is, will you follow me? 
Will you trust in me? Will you, will you place your hope in me, not the process? Will you place your hope in me, not the outcome? If we will, we'll discover that hope has a name. Jesus, the hope, is the captain of courage and the author of success. We need courage for 2023. And if we're going to be successful in God, it's not going to have you figuring it out on paper. What faith does it require to check box and fill in lines and, and, and sign off on this or that? That's not faith. That's rules. That's regiment. God wants us to be flowing with him, trusting him, being close to him, being so dependent on him. Where he goes, you go. Where he moves, you move. That's what he said that he was doing. I only say what I hear my father saying, and I only do what I see my father doing. Well, if we're the offspring of God, if we're sons and daughters of God, we ought to be practicing the same model. Hope is the captain of courage, the author of success. My question for you is, will you let Jesus be the captain of your boat? In 2023. Several weeks ago, we prepared this video, which I'm going to show you as we close. When we, when we prepped it, we've been hanging on to it for weeks. I had no idea the impact that it was going to be, the timing that it was going to have. If we will be committed to following our year and the balance of our lives will be changed forever. Bring the house lights down for me. Let's play this video. I was in Alaska doing a lawsuit we're way out in the Aleutian Islands, getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage and then home. And I had a ticket in my pocket to get on an airplane. And a pastor came up and he said, listen, I can save you money. I said, how's that? He said, I flew a small airplane up here and I fly a small airplane and I can take you in my little airplane and you can save your ticket. And this did not sound, I said, gee, thank you so very, very much. But I've got this ticket. We'll just make our way on home, me and this other lawyer with me. He said, no, 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 you got to do it. you got to do it. And against every better judgment I had, I said, okay. Well, we went out to the airport, took us by his little plane, and I looked at it. And I thought, well, one good thing, it's shiny. Then he walked around it. We got in. He's on the left front. I'm on the right front. The other lawyer's sitting right behind me. And he started it up, and it started up just fine. Well, we taxied out. I said, should we pray? He said, yeah, that's a good idea. We normally don't. I said, well, this time we're going <laughs> to. And I'm telling you, I prayed five, eight minutes. I prayed a long time. We went and got on the runway. He starts down the runway. The plane lifted off ever so gently, and we start climbing. And it's wonderful. Not a problem in the world. We started climbing, and we flew probably three, four minutes. And something happened that will never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me and he said, we're going in the clouds and I can't fly in clouds. They make me pass out. I said, clouds make you do what? <laughs> now it's been cloudy all day. And we go right up into the clouds and you can't see anything. And he looks at me and his eyes roll back in his head. And he starts mumbling and he passes out, passed out cold. Now I grabbed him and I shook him and I said, come on, you gotta wake up so I can kill you. Now we're in the clouds flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, we're dead, aren't we? I said, there's a very good chance of that, yes. He said, what are we gonna do? I said, I don't know. But there was a radio right there and I handed him the microphone and I said, start asking for help. So he's in the back seat reaching up and he said, hello, hello. We didn't know any proper radio etiquette. All we were saying was hello. And somebody answered back, hello, hello. Don't you guys know proper radio etiquette? And I said, give it me. I said, tell them we don't know nothing. Tell them we're in an airplane with a passed out pilot and we don't know how to fly this plane. The guy said, I'm a freighter flying out of Anchorage on the way to Tokyo. And he said, you're telling me you have nobody who can fly that plane with you? I said, tell them that's correct. Now you gotta understand, I am sweating bullets. He said, the first thing I'm gonna do is start circling so I don't lose you because I'll fly out of range of your radio and you won't have me anymore. And he said, I'm gonna get Anchorage Emergency for you. And Anchorage Emergency will be the people that can maybe help you try to save your life. After about five minutes, Anchorage came on, said, we understand you have a passed out pilot. And those of you do not know how to fly that plane. We said, that's right. They said, well, the first thing we gotta do is find you. And I'll never forget what this man at Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. He said, that's my job. 
But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you got to promise me you'll obey my voice. He said, you can't see me, but I can see you. And he said, if you're not going to obey my voice, you're going to die. When you can't see anything, you have no idea how disorientated you become. Finally, he said, okay, I found you. Now hear me clear. He said, you're four minutes from a mountain. He said, you're going to crash in that mountain and die. Follow my voice. I never said, I have to follow your voice. Is that reasonable? You see, I understood without his voice, I had nothing. And do you understand? Without God's voice, you have nothing. Nothing. Finally, he got us turned. And he said, I'm freezing all the traffic in the area. He said, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get you to Anchorage. And there's a lot of weather between you and Anchorage. You're in for a rough ride. And he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay attention to the storm, just my voice. He said, if you start watching the storm, you will die. But I'll take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several pilots, those nighttime freighters, those 747s started talking to us. They said, we're praying for you, men. You're going to make it. But listen to the voice. That's the key. They said, trust the voice. Do you realize your head is full of voices? And everybody in this world wants to talk to you. And everybody wants to be the controlling voice. And God says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar and let my voice be your voice. Finally, we went through the worst of the weather, but there was still more. And then the voice came back and it said, now, I'm going to line you up. He said, I'm going to bring you in right down the runway. And at the foot of the runway are some lights, and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't you forget this. The cross is the way home. Finally, he's bringing us down. We still can't see anything. And all he kept saying is, stay with me. My sheep, the Bible says, hear my voice, and they follow me. Finally, just a couple hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. <laughs> Finally, it all came to a stop, and the minute we stopped, the pilot woke up. The voice said, thanks for listening. I watch them crash and burn all the time because they won't follow my voice. They don't understand I'm the one who can see them even when they can't see me but they get the voices in their head and they kill themselves. They self-destruct. Thanks for listening to the voice. Then they put us in a motel room at about four in the morning, a knock at my door. And I opened the door and a man was standing there. He said, hello, David. He said, you're the voice. You're the one who got me home. He said, I am. Do you understand one day you're going to stand before him and say, you were the voice. You're the voice that brought me home. If you're not on that altar as a living sacrifice, your head's full of voices. And then we wonder why kids crash and burn. We wonder why marriages are shattered. And the Lord's saying, I'm the one who has the voice. All I can remember is that voice saying, stay with me. Amen. Stay with me. Don't listen to what's going on in your head and don't watch the storm. Stay with me. And I'll take you through. Tonight you have a God who has promised to take you through. A living sacrifice, holy. Yeah, good. <clears throat> I, I want to. I want to close with this. I, I love so many aspects of of my profession, my job. I love to study scripture. I love to teach. I love to talk. It's hard to shut me up. But most importantly, if there's a legacy that I want to be known of me 
or a legacy that's known of this church is that we help people hear the voice of God. Because it's not about being a student. It's not about knowing God's stuff. It really is about knowing God. If we will commit to putting ourselves in positions and posturing our hearts to listening for the voice of the Holy Spirit, he will lead us and guide us. He'll navigate us through the dry spells, the valleys and the mountaintops. And this will be a year like none other, no matter what's happening peripherally, as long as we continue to trust the voice. I wanna invite you to stand as I pray over you. I wanna thank those who joined us online again. We appreciate you carving out time to do so. We invite you to join us in person and we look forward to meeting you.